Hi, today's a very special day for me. I didn't realize 13, 14 years ago when I first met Craig Morgan that we would be sharing the, the platform together. At that point in time, I was working for a national leadership ministry and uh, he was in a conference and we were both growing as leaders. They were in a major transition in their life and their business. We were in a major transition in our life and our ministry. And when we connected, we just sort of connected. I, it's one of those things to where, have you ever met somebody and you just like them immediately? And man, I just, I just sort of, I was like, man, I like Craig. He's just a cool guy. And throughout the years, I'm not going to tell you that we're absolute best friends because I can tell you that, that I don't know that that'd be a, an accurate statement, but I can tell you that we're very good friends. And God has used Craig to speak into my life. And he's been on this journey with his family on blending a blended family and bringing that together. And I don't know if you've ever been involved in that. Maybe you, you're involved in that. Maybe you're not. Maybe you might be in the future as you deal with a, a, a child or a grandchild. But it's amazing the truths and the, the things, the journey that they've been through and what they've learned from it. And now, as you follow Craig on his blog, and, and we'll give you information about that, and they have a, a ministry that I'm going to let them describe, but it's helping families that are blending to blend better and tighter. And it's making the blend better. You know, you go to Starbucks, and there's just something about a, a roasted blend, just coffee that just has a little bit more in it than what just a single bean you know what I'm saying it's just a different kind of a blend they've learned how to make make Starbucks out of a married family a blended family and make a better blend and so I want you to give a very warm welcome to Craig and Gina Morgan and they're gonna come up here and we're just gonna talk together today Craig Gina it's so good to have you You guys have a seat here, and let's talk. And uh, first, Gina, do us a favor and uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll let Craig do the same. Well, thank you so much for having us. And first, I want to say, boy, have we been a blend. We've been one of those deep-roasted, fired, <laughs> gone-through-the-fire kind of blend of coffee. So, um, well, just a little bit about us. Um, we met... Um, 19, 20, 21 years ago on a blind date. So there is hope on blind dates, a lot of hope. And um, met through a mutual friend who knew that I was going through um, a very tough time in my life. Um, my husband of 12 years had left, so I was a single mom with four little boys, the youngest being two weeks old. Wow. So after pulling myself up through being physically sick, emotionally devastated, um, I decided I've got four sets of eyeballs looking at me. I better grab on to God right now. And that was my crisis of faith. I had always, uh, all through our marriage, been a believer, but had not really dug in for myself to know the Lord. I had, I had ridden my husband's spiritual coattail and let him do the connecting. I'll go along with whatever you hear. But at that point, I dug in, and that was the first not time in my life I could say that I really began to know, know Christ and know his love and his grace, uh, because I had nowhere, I had nothing else to do. Uh, I mean, I had nothing. Honestly, it was, I woke up one night in the middle of the night, and I remember the Lord saying to me, who are you going to trust? Are you going to mm. trust your circumstances or are you going to trust me? Because the circumstances were pretty grim. So um, that's when I had my crisis of faith and decided I'm going to walk this walk and keep my eyes on him no matter what's going on. And when you were talking about tithing a minute ago, that is when I learned how to tithe when I was broke, absolutely wow. Broke, but I took those four little boys. I went to church. We were living in Arkansas. Went to church uh, in in Texarkana. It was called Church on the Rock. And if it was a dollar, is all I could give, I gave it. And I I saw God's miracles just absolutely take over in our life. I couldn't believe it. Um, he just not that 
not that I walked outside and found a Cadillac or anything like that, but he provided. He provided food. He provided just peace. The peace that I had that I could go to sleep at night was just overwhelming to my friends that I could wow. be so peaceful. So uh, I guess a year and some later, I had um, an, a friend that called and spoke into my life and said, I, I've been keeping up with you through your mom, and um, I know what's going on, and I have someone that I would like for you to meet. Well, so <laughs> you know how when somebody says that, you're like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but then she pursued and called a few months later and um, got me, I guess, at a, at, a, at a really low time. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Craig. So, I, hey, I'm that song. That She's got friends in low places. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> You're that friend. Huh? He, he said I could be honest, brutally honest. <laughs> also, I'm just being honest. That's it was so at funny. a time where I thought, you know, I think I will go and visit my mom in Dallas and see what's going on here. <laughs> so, I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> oh, from there. Uh, <laughs> gee, with that with that introduction, what what more do I need to say? No. Um, but, uh, yeah, Charlie, I mean, at that point, it was really interesting because the crisis of faith that we both hit when we both went through, oh my goodness, we've got some major stuff we got to deal with. We're both divorced. We both had kids, but it was totally different. She ran to God. I ran away from him. I said, forget you, forget your church, forget, and I just got real angry. And that kind of sent me down a spiral for seven years until... Ex explain that for a minute. Sure. I mean, what, what was it yeah. to cause you just to say, <clears throat> yeah, that's it? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, my, my parents are here, and uh, they were like champions for me. My mom believed in me. She was my first cheerleader. My dad coached me in sports. I had a grandmother that I know she prayed over me. She believed in me. So I just had this figured out that I wouldn't have such a boom, rough hit that part in the road. And because I had to blame somebody, I guess, instead of looking in the mirror and thought, well, what did you do, Craig, that, you know, contributed to this? No, it, I didn't. So I just decided to get angry and that kind of sent me down a spiral for seven years. And then this leadership conference that we had a connection, um, it was at one of those conferences that our mutual friend, I was sitting right here where this gentleman was, row one, seat one, mm -hmm. and uh, the guy that was doing the conference said, I've got three goals of this leadership conference. One, he wanted us to be better leaders. Two, he wanted us to have resources that could teach us to be better leaders. But this is what happened. He said, if those two things happen, this will be a good conference. But if this third thing happens, it'll be a great conference. And so I'd already thought, I'd already figured out what I needed. He says, that's God coming and do, does a new work in your heart. Wow. And I broke. Hmm. Now, we had married. We were probably, what, a year and a half into our blending? A year and a half, two years? Right at, no, right at a year. Right at a year. Right a year. So I go home to my new wife, and I say, honey, I'm a mess. I love you, but... I'm just, I, I don't know what I got. I got to get away. So her best friend happened to be in the kitchen, and she says, well, I know where you ought to go. Go to Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's beautiful. There's the Incline Railway. They, they fought a civil war. I thought, fine. I didn't care what. I just, I knew I needed to get away. And that was the beginning of, like, <laughs> the Lord coming back and saying, I ain't done with you yet. Wow. I still love you. Um, so I just had to kind of get healed, if you want to say it that way. How did, let me ask you a couple of questions. And uh, How did the divorce for each of you spiritually impact you? And, and let's just be on, uh, help us all out here. Yeah. What, how did that affect your relationship with God? What did it do? Uh, yeah, um, I think I'd put too much faith in the external, uh, the denomination, 
or my ex-wife's father happened to be an elder in the church where we were going. He was a military man. And I realized I'd put too much stock into the external stuff. It was never a relationship problem with me and Jesus. or me and God. But obviously my priorities were looking at people versus my master. So that's what it did for me. So did you feel like you failed God when there was this divorce? What, what was that relationship like between you and God? Yeah, I did. And then you have people around you tell you that you're a failure. Wow. Um, well, you're not a leader anymore. Well, you've screwed up your biggest thing ever. It's your family. I mean, so then all that kind of compounds mm -hmm. that makes me or it made me more angry and more resistant at that time. So it, it, it sent me in a spiral for about seven years. Wow. Gina, what about you? With me, um, like I said, I, I, I felt that I, well, first of all, let me back up. My first husband and I were helping couples in our church. And what I mean by helping, we were taking couples that were having issues or problems, and we were taking them to marriage conferences at our church. So when this happened, it really threw me because I thought, here we are helping couples, and then he's decided to walk out. So I didn't see it coming. Um, I was shocked. But like I said, I, I had a strong group of women around me, and that was that was so good for the first time in my life, that's when I really decided to grab hold and get in the word on my own and um, just surround myself with godly women in our, in our church. Mm -hmm. And um, that honestly uh, got me through a, a, a lot of tough nights, uh, just knowing that I had that uh, the wiser, older women that I looked up to that gathered around me that prayed for me, um, and I, that's when I, my faith probably grew the most ever. You must have been terrified. I was horrified. I couldn't keep food down. I literally thought, what am I going to do um, financially? Um, I had been out of the workforce. I had put him through school for six years, and he was a doctor. So I had worked, you know, f for all those years, and then I had started our, our clinic, our business, and had worked there for two or three years. And then I'd been home with the kids and so much had happened out in corporate America, the computers and all this that I was so far removed from. And I was, I was terrified on what I was gonna do. But once I decided to trust God and not look at my circumstances, doors opened. I ended up moving to Dallas. Uh, my mom, you know, threw, opened some doors and I met some people and got a job. So things happen, and God took care of things. He provided. And when I look back now, when I look back at some of that, it's like I honestly, in, like in the, on paper, you don't know how it could have possibly worked. Um, but he worked things out. Wow. Now, talk to us about this blend. You got yours, yours, and ours. Yep. Because now all of a sudden, people that weren't in your life are now in your life. And, I mean, your sons, this, you know, because boys have a tendency to connect or be attracted to a male figure or role model. And, and right. so now all of a sudden, you're bringing someone in. Walk us through through those years and yeah. the blend. Yeah. Just just be honest. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's uh, it's a journey, like uh, we both know. I think that'll help give you kind of a perspective. Is that when we went through this, it was what like late nineties, ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand, where we started to. Well, yeah, but I mean, we married in 96, but when we first started really trying to figure out how do we do this, how do we do, there was nobody helping you. I mean, there was no books, there were no seminars, and with all due respect to some of the great 
family ministries like Focus or Family. Nobody was touching blended families. It's and pretty so, taboo. Right. So literally everything Gina and I did was by trial and error. Um, you know, I go into your question about the boys and the male figure. Well, she was like, for the first time, I've got a man in the house that can help me kind of corral four rambunctious boys. So I just knew what was modeled for me. So dad's usually the primary disciplinarian. Mom's usually the primary nurturer. So I think I was secure enough that I didn't need the, I never told them that I'm your dad or you need to, but I just wanted to have respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when it came time and they were out of alignment, you know, and, and there was discipline, well then I'd do the little paddling when they were little and we learned by, again, error, mm -hmm. that in a blended family, that any discipline should be done by the biological parent, not the step, for a couple reasons. She had history with her kids, I didn't. There was blood runs deep. There was a natural bond where, you know, I'm coming in. But we didn't know it at the time. So that was one of the mistakes that we made in trying to blend. If we could go back, we would redo that totally. Mm -hmm. um, you could speak to like realignment, you know, and, mm -hmm. and lots of other things. But that's, that's just one thing. Um, you want to take another one? Well, um, the realignment issue. Um, you know, you've got your kids that you're loyal to. He's got his kids that he's loyal to. And then we have one that's ours. And um, there's, there's so many different um, moving parts in that, that um, so many of the times I felt that his loyalty was more to his children. And it was. Let me say it back then. And it was. And it was. Be because when we went through it, if I, could say, I made a commitment to my kids that don't worry, dad's here. Mom loves you. Dad loves you. It's a promise between us. But I wanted to make sure they felt secure, so I literally put my kids in first place, and I put her in second place. So the realignment issue mm -hmm. in a blended family, the kids really come first, and the spouse comes second. And, of course, in a nuclear family, it's the spouse comes first, and the kids come second. So we got to figure out a way to realign this thing over time. Mm -hmm. But talk about maybe the pace and the blending process, but that was another mm -hmm. issue. Well, before you go into that, let's take a moment on that, because this is one of those deals which I didn't know. Would you say uh, most blended families have a re-divorce rate at 67? Six, 67%. So Re-divorce. So they divorce, they remarry, and then 67% are going to re-divorce again? That's correct. Wow. So... When you start talking about this alignment stuff, how did, how did you work through that? Because if, if each of you are making your kids the first priority, then it almost seems like you're having a civil, civil war, war. <laughs> yeah. in your home. One family under God divided. Yep. Am I seeing that correctly? Uh, you are. You want to talk to that? Once I got them straightened out, we were fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really a true statement. <laughs> she was better at that. Talk about it. Well, <clears throat> he, he was my priority, and I think sure. he would agree with that. Yep. Um, my boys would probably agree with that because they wanted to be my priority, but he was my priority. Um, and don't ever take all your kids if you're in a blended family and go have a golf tournament with his kids and him against your kids and you. That doesn't work either. <laughs> there was a lot of divots You didn't day. do that, did you? <laughs> yeah, I you did. did. <laughs> I told you everything I've done has been wrong, Charlie. I mean, everything. I just thought, well, let's have some fun. So I'm competitive, so... I mean, I knew I these kids. Earth well, that day but here's why. Means of a golf club. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is so funny. Because her kids wanted to be. I thought, well, they want to be on the same team because their last name's Prim. So I thought, Their first family vacation. Yeah, nearly and the I'd last. Say, the Morgan kids. I thought, well, they're bonded. They want to be on the same team, but not having any clue, we're actually not crossing the lines to make it one. We're actually 
getting more entrenched, you know, the other way. So, but yeah, so she was better. <laughs> I'm a slow learner, <laughs> but I'm trying to get there. So Gina, how do, you, how do you navigate through this? How do you choose between your husband and your kids? And how do you well, I'll, explain that to I'll them? I'll say there's times that I did it plenty wrong. There's times that I sided with them or, and did it the wrong way where I, I mean, let, let me be the first to tell you, we did everything wrong. So if we can still be together after 18 years yeah. and all the things that we did wrong, we just, we want you to know there's hope. Right. And it, it took a lot of forgiveness, yeah. a lot of forgiveness in a blended family. If, if you have an issue with forgiving, my goodness, it took a lot of forgiveness, <clears throat> a lot of learning how to say I'm sorry. And I would have to say that a big turning point I think in our marriage, we had been married maybe seven years. We attended something that used to be over at the Plano Center. They're now having it in Frisco called the Life Enrichment Boot Camp. And they're online. Um, and it is a boot camp that's Wednesday night through Friday night and all day Saturday. It's a big time, big part of your time that you, you know, have to, to you know, give to go do this. But it was so worth it. Um, we worked through so many things going through that that I don't think that we would have we would have gotten out between us um, had we not gone to it, and that was a huge turning point for us. It was a huge turning point, I think, where he started seeing that I felt like I was, you know, second behind his kids, and that had been really hurtful and hard for our relationship and for the trust between us. So. Yeah, if I could just add one postscript to that. Mm -hmm. um, and do you mind if I do it in the form of a question real quick? How many of y'all were ever impacted by divorce? Just the immediate north, south, east, west. That means either you or your mom or dad or your son or daughter or just brother or sister. Raise your hand just real quick. Look around the room. Now, Charlie, wow. the odds, that means they're going to, whoever that is, they're going to attempt it again. The majority mm -hmm. try to remarry like we did. And what we found out is that you can't do marriage and family the same way um, as you do in a nuclear family. So because of that, um, it's, there's a need for everybody to kind of understand and get their hands around this animal, like how do we do this? And my point would be there's only one way any marriage, any family is going to work. The marriage has got to come first. It won't work. Any other way. And it's just more challenging in a blended family because, again, there's loyalty issues. And those run deep. You know, there's hurt. Mm -hmm. You come out of divorce and you got guilt. You got shame. You got, you just, there's a ton of stuff. But the only way that we could sit here and tell you that we made it was that we, of course, in our faith, but it was because she made me number one, I made her number one, and we had to realign and the kids actually were second and then that's what I think has been huge for us let me ask you a question about the kids because um, a lot of times when children experience their parents divorce the kids have a tendency to blame themselves mm -hmm. and it creates a um, I don't know that dysfunction is the right word maybe it, it breaks a social pattern in the child so as a pastor I've seen kids either really pull back or really go a different direction and almost like leave family and create their own family outside of their family That's true. so how do you deal with this let's go back to the single side uh, you know BC before Craig BG before Gina and you're dealing with that and then you're bringing these kids in together and now they have to find some type of social relationship because they've been forced into something mm -hmm. called mom got married, dad got married. Walk us through that. Sure. Well, <clears throat> I would say 
I had this idea that when we got married, we were going to be one happy family. I love his kids, he loves mine, and Preston loves everybody, of course. And <clears throat> it was uh, far from that. I really had that idea that it was going to be that way. Um, if I could say bef before us, before we had ever gotten married, what I would do have done differently, and what he we've talked about this, um, we would have taken it a lot slower with the meaning we would have involved, involved the kids a lot earlier on, done more things with the kids, talk to them more about this, let them talk more about this, and it not just being our decision and mm -hmm. we're going to all love one another, but we would have involved them way earlier on, um, probably done a little bit more. We did premarital counseling, but would have probably done a little more with them and letting them go alone and with us because uh, I will tell you that if you've got kids that have hurts that are not um, getting past this that then they carry that into adulthood and then you're dealing with adult children with baggage and hurts that were never addressed so um, by all means we are all for getting help uh, we have a wonderful life coach that's in our life that we um, are so grateful that we've known her. She was m one of my best friends that I first met when I moved to Dallas um, 22 years ago. And she has walked us through many things, us together when we couldn't resolve them, and our kids individually. And I'm, we're certainly all for, you know, doing that. So. And if I could add just one thing to that. Um, Take what Gina said and do family dating, meaning get your kids, her kids, our kids, whatever the mix is, mm -hmm. and just go to a movie, go to the park, you know, go to McDonald's. It doesn't matter, but just get everybody together because what they're really doing is they're kind of testing the water. Do I like you? Do I trust you? And then how far do I like you? How far can I trust you? And we would have done more of that than just us courting. We would have courted our kids through that process. Mm -hmm. and, and then the second thing that we learned through all this blending process is you don't determine the pace that your kids come together. The kids determine the pace of blending. And some kids will come along faster. And some kids will come along slower. Um, one of Gina's boys, I'm convinced, just kind of dug his heels into the ground when, we, when I first came in his life. And it's like him saying, you're not my dad. I don't have to love you like my dad. I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to obey you. And that was just kind of the, that he made that decision. So it's been a lot longer for him to get to like me and trust me. Now, he's there, but I didn't determine that pace. He's got to determine the pace at how we blend. Talk about the X factor. Good question. Go. <laughs> oh, that's because mine was the most difficult one. Amen. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> learn to not always say what's on your mind. <laughs> um, gee. Uh, if we could have read, you know, some of the resources, and I'm trying to think of her name, uh, Tammy Daughtry. Daughtry, that has a book out now called Co-Parenting. Co-Parenting. Wow, if we had had something like that back when we were starting this early on, that would have been such a help. But like I'm, like I'm saying, we did everything wrong, we can tell you. So uh, God has a lot of grace. Um, but, wow, that, that was tough. There was a lot of times that I had to uh, bite my tongue and let him be right for the sake of the kids. I never wanted to put my kids in the middle. I never wanted to stand my ground on a visitation just because it was my weekend. Sometimes you just need to let it go and let the kids not be caught in the middle. Uh, because I had four boys and two of them decided they wanted to go try living with their dad. and. Uh, I always was open, it was an open door. If you want to go live with your dad, you know, you need to do that to experience. There was such a severed relationship there that I had a, a great 
man of God that was um, our marriage counselor tell me that that's not an offense against me because I took it so offensive. I'm like, here, I'm now finally getting to stay home and be a stay-at-home mom again with you guys and y'all one by one want to go try living with your dad. So, and he lived in East Texas at that time and um, the gentleman that was speaking into our life, our, our counselor said, you know, they've got to go back and see if that relationship is still there. It was severed. Uh, it's just something a, a boy wants to do. And so I was so glad he told me that because I took it, you know, so um, it, it really cut, it cut, my, cut right to the heart. So, um, so there for a period of time, I had two and he had two. So I was on the road twice a month meeting halfway. And there were times when the boys had things and it was my visitation, they had things going on. And I had determined that I was not gonna be the parent to say, by golly, it's my weekend, you come to my house. Because it was done that way on the opposite end. And that really doesn't work, that doesn't work well. Um, there were so many times we just had to, you know, step back and give up a weekend, give up a holiday for the sake of the kids because it's, it's not about us, it's about the kids. Yeah. And when you keep that in mind, Charlie, it's all about the kids. That's the issue. So in a, when you all of a sudden, you've got an ex and you've got to now have co-parenting, how do we still parent our child, though the relational, the marriage part of our relationship is over? And, you know, there's a couple ways that most people try to co-parent. Um, one, they just become enemies. And they literally use their kids as almost bait and sneaking and, you know, not, which is not going to work, obviously, because remember, it's all about the kids. And we, I think we both tried to take the high road. I'm sure we weren't perfect, but we tried to take the high road in that. Um, and then you can go the other extreme, which usually doesn't happen, but people just become like perfect pals. Uh, but you've got to kind of get in the middle where you're like cooperative type colleagues where you can sit down and say, can we get together and just talk about the kids, what your expectations are in your household, mm -hmm. what mine are, because we both want the best for our children. Mm -hmm. And I think if you take that posture, that's the best way to deal with the exes. We have some situations, and I want to be very cautious in the way that I talk about this because we don't reveal confidences of people we just that's a core value here it's a safe place but I do know that there are some families right now and the way that one family steps in and says this is the core values and the discipline factor of our home versus what it is it's a night and day world and so it's like you finally get the kids in your rhythm. They go with the ex or they go to the other family. And it's, it's a completely different dynamic. And then they have to bring them back. And there's a lot of friction. Mm -hmm. on a, what, what advice would you give to parents that are in that type of situation? I'll, I'll answer that. Because yeah. <clears throat> we used to go through about a three-day, I call it a three-day detox. I didn't tell that to the kids, but Craig and I'd be like, oh, God, here we are. We're in detox. Here we go. So, honestly, we would give my boys two to three days to do this and pretty much let it just come out, you know, just let them go through it, let them act out their anger, spout off, whatever. And then after that, it was like, okay, got it. That's enough. Um, you know, you're back here, this is where you live, and we know, we, we let you, we've listened to you for two or three days, and, you know, that's, this is, this is our home, and these are our rules, and we love you. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, and just, and, from the kids' perspective, I can just take my daughter as an example, um, when we her mom and I divorced, we had it all figured out, okay, Monday, Wednesday, and the first, third, and Friday weekends were with me, mm -hmm. okay? And that's how we started, she was little. 
And there came a point where she goes, Dad, it's just so difficult. Am I with you today? Am I with Mom today? And I had to realize, okay, do I pack the bag? Am I going to Dad's this weekend? And it's just, you got to put the kids. Now, again, that's where mine were. They were little. But it's just like when you're dealing with that, remember, it's all about the kids. And what happens in that other person's household, regardless if they can watch TV and eat sweets before dinner, let it go. As long as they're not being harmed, you know, physically or sexually or something like you really have, just let it go. You just have different values. You have different rules, different guidelines. But the best thing you can do for the kid, they'll figure out, you know, um, how it is. But mm-hmm. I would just say, remember, it's about the kids and what they're kind of going through. Right. And I want to say that um, not to speak uh, ill of the other parent. It never, Absolutely. that never does any good. Um, actually, I, I, have, I had a friend ask me one time, but they're, you know, and she was having an issue with an ex, and I said, you've got to find something good. I know there's something good about your ex that you can think of that he does or is or was or something, and that's, that's the one thing that you've got to hit home with the kids. You know, whether it be that I told my boys your dad was an amazing doctor, and told a story of something he did, you know, that helped a patient or, um, you know, that he used to, or he's a great, great fisherman. And uh, I actually used to tell him he, he uh, had such great patience with y'all, um, whereas I didn't as much. I mean, find something good. And I know you can dig deep and find something, but say good things. Yep. And that's hard because at first I didn't. I made the mistake and said some of the negative things, and that never works. It never works. You know, our time is slipping away, and I, I want to ask you this question, and then we're going to have to begin to wrap up. But <clears throat> his, hers, ours. What did the hour factor do to your home? Did that make it worse better how did the kids perceive now that you have your own child where am i at on the ranking list of love i mean walk us through that dynamic um i'd first say that i'm still getting more research but i can tell you our personal experience preston when is the hours child again she had four i had two we have one between us when he's growing up It's just funny, the dynamics of how kids, he goes, how come I'm gypped? I go, what are you talking about? They got two moms and two dads. I just got one mom and one dad. (laughs) And I'm sitting there going, well, that's how he would see it. I mean, he really thought that. He used Uh, to want to go with my boys to their dads. because. And my kids to their moms. I'm like, no, son, it ain't going to work, but I understand where he's coming from. Um, I I think from his perspective, It's a little glue because he can take this half and that half and we can kind of put it together. Um, But as we've talked to many blended families, I don't think that's a prerequisite. So in other words, if somebody's thinking, okay, if I'm able to have a child, should we have one so we can, I I wouldn't say yes. Now it doesn't mean no, but it just, I don't think that's a factor. Um, but, uh, But I think it helped us a, a little bit because they both could kind of claim him as half mine. Mm-hmm. What would you say to a church that is aware family divorce or maybe a small group, whatever, and all of a sudden it's it's going to be a different dynamic? And it's and I think it's human nature to try to choose sides. You know, some of the best advice I ever received in seminary, and. Um, very few things you remember from seminary (laughs) and the stuff you did remember and it didn't work you got rid of that real quick but uh, really good advice when asked to choose sides and both sides are wrong don't and I'll never forget that piece of advice in fact when I when the professor said it it was almost like God said you better write that down don't ever forget that but as a church, we want everybody to come in and, and belong here. Even if they don't believe yet, we want them to belong. Mm-hmm. 
And we want to give people, you know, as I study the, the disciples and Jesus, uh, just our church knows this. I'm on this journey of just reading through the Gospels over and over and over again. I just feel like I need to know Jesus better. And the one thing that I realized is that he brought disciples towards him who didn't even believe in him. Yeah. In fact, it wasn't until Matthew 16 that, G, that P Peter said, wow, you're, you're the son of God. And Jesus goes, <laughs> bingo, <laughs> now I can give you the keys to the kingdom. You, you got, and nobody else chimed in. So out of 12, one believed. And Jesus did life with these guys. And they, they didn't all even come to the point of acceptance of his lordship until even after he resurrected from the dead. And I think sometimes we try to put this pressure on people to be conformed to an image of Christ they haven't discovered yet. And so as a pastor, I'm pretty cognizant of this and realize we're all on a journey. But coach me. Help me as a pastor. Help us as a church. We like marriages to work. We do our best to help them work. But when they don't, what would you say to us as a church and as a pastor? What would Give me a nugget. Give me something here. I think... On the surface, I've watched you guys for many years. Yeah. Um, I've seen y'all change your culture and your name from Family Worship Center to Genesis Church. And I look around today and I see just a group of people that you can't help but just love. Mm -hmm. um, totally, probably your A to Z, you know, blue collar, white collar, younger, older. I think you're doing it, Charlie. I think the body right here, it's, it's who you are. I mean, we're walking in the door and smiling faces, and the guy that's helping us park the car is talking as we're coming up, and we come and meet some of the staff, and they're so warm. I just think be a loving, forgiving, grace-filled body, and I think y'all are modeling that. That's how we feel when we came here today. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you. You should give yourself a hand right there. Huh? You're awesome. Gina, what would you say? Well, and I think it was Andy Stanley I heard say this once before, is that the church should be looked at like, like a hospital where the hurting people can come, whether, you know, divorced, whether, um, you know, issues with sexuality. I mean hurting people. And some of them, some of them, have make it nearly where you have to be cleaned up and have your stuff together before you can go. And that's not the way the church was set up. It was set up, you know, like, like a hospital for the hurting and the lost and the hopeless um, to come. And I can say that I felt that when we came from the time we got out of the car, you know, till we came in. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling here. So. I want you to pray for family. We haven't even had a chance to talk about the parent factor, how your parents, because obviously they have a, you know, they had a daughter-in-law that was taken out of their life and a new daughter-in-law brought in. And, you know, I don't know that you quit loving someone just because a relationship with someone else doesn't work. You know, I love my sister. Um, she's been married three times, and this marriage is is doing very well, and, and and God's really helped her. But I'll be honest with you, I really liked her first husband. <laughs> Not to take away from the other two, but I really liked the first guy, you know? And I sort of got, felt gypped. Yeah. I, I lost him and got her, you know? I mean, I... <laughs> Roxanne, if you're watching this, I, you know I love you, but just <laughs> stop. Don't go where I'm not going. But, um, but I think that there's some issues that, you know, we could sit down. In fact, it'd be cool maybe if you guys could come back or maybe we could do something on a weekend with, with some families and, and just have some of those conversations. I mean, people want to catch your blog if they want to, if they want to latch on because you're not a pastor. You're not a minister, man. You're in no. the insurance business. And you're, you guys have been trying to build a business the whole time this is going on. And so, I mean, it's literally like just pulling up 
some people that are just sitting out there in the chairs and saying, hey, come on up here and tell us all your junk. And uh, <laughs> because we've known each other long enough, right. we, we, we can do that. But um, I, th I think it'd be helpful. I read your, um, your blog. In fact, it, it's emailed. It puts me under guilt and condemnation because I'm, I have these great ideas. I just don't blog them. And so I gotta, my blog hadn't been updated since September, so I've got to go in and update mine. But if people want to follow your stuff or they want to learn from you, what, what do they need to do? What, it's, yeah, it's uh, Blended Together Forever is the name of the ministry. Um, you, can, you can like the Facebook page where we've got a girl that does a lot of the social media that we write it, get it to her, and she, I don't know, puts three or four posts a day. Um, and then we write Tuesdays and Fridays and try so people can get some material and just um, and then we've written a book that Sheena's finishing the editing process mm -hmm. in fact I think the folks out here I, we brought a hundred book cards if you're interested in that um, you can obviously do that um, and then uh, the website, yeah, I think it's, uh, or was it Blended it, Together? It was just up there. I thought so. BlendedTogether.org. Um, we'll get them there, too. And um, I, I think the big thing, if there's anything that uh, somebody knows we should connect with, um, we're meeting lots of pastors now mm -hmm. that are very, very interested. And um, one church probably will want to host a seminar we do next year. And... We're speaking at First Baptist Wiley after the first of the year. And so I think the church is just now saying, we got needs that we want. So if there's any, that's just what I'd say, you know. Cool. So people go to blendedtogether.org? Yep, blendedtogether.org. And then uh, you can sign up and get a weekly uh, blog and uh, email and some great material. Thank you for coming. Have you enjoyed Craig and Gina today? It's been Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Thanks very much. You know, our time's slipping away, but here's what I'd like to ask you to do, because the amount of hands that were raised, if it wasn't a majority of hands here, it was close. Um, would you just pray over people that are in this situation or trying to heal? And, you know, I think sometimes we yeah. overestimate like a day like today and underestimate the process of getting through the rest of the days. Mm -hmm. And so... Would y'all just pray for people? Yeah. I just I wanted to say something real quick. <clears throat> there were many times when we were going through some some issues with kids and relationships, and um, we're both very colorful people, meaning we can duke it out. Mm -hmm. And there were so many times when we had to just look at each other in the face, in the eyes, and say, "This is not about us." I love you, you love me, this is about our kids. And there were so many times that he would say, it, it's going to be okay, we're going to get through this. Even though he didn't like me then, and I didn't like him, I knew he loved me. And it wasn't about us. We knew how we were, for, you know, we knew how we felt about each other. This was about an issue with the kids or you know, something like that. And I had a Somebody asked me a while back, how did you guys make it 18 years? And I said, because we didn't quit. And it got ugly. And there was a lot of mudslinging, but we didn't quit. And that's how you make it to the other side. You don't quit. You don't give up. Um, so now we are empty nesters for the first time in 18 years. Our youngest, our baby, went off to college. Um, he's playing football in Abilene for Hardin-Simmons. So he just left home this fall, <clears throat> and so in a blended marriage, your honeymoon comes at the end. <laughs> so we're honeymooning wow. now. That's awesome. We waited a long time for our honeymoon. <laughs> hey, Gina, would you do me a favor? Would you pray over the kids? And Craig, would you pray over the adults? The, uh, and um, Pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity um, for us to be here today. You are so good, and thank you so much for just the grace that you have bestowed on us to walk through 
um, all that we have in our marriage and, and in our children's lives. I pray right now for all the kids involved here that have been in a broken home, that's, that are in a blended family, and Lord, I just ask for your grace and mercy. Um, just, I pray for their hearts. I pray for healing and restoration. I pray that they grab hold of you, God, like no other. Um, because that's truly where the peace and the truth comes from. Uh, I thank you, Father, that uh, you give these parents wisdom, um, that you help them to forgive, and that you just have your mercy and your hand on them. In Jesus' name. Father, thanks for the parents. Thanks for the uh, ex-spouses. Thanks for, uh, for loving us and for, for saving us. And, um, Father, for those that are in a blended family, just I, I pray for the moms right now. And I just ask that they remember it's about their husband and that they honor their husband. They make him first. They can lovingly submit to his leadership, and he lovingly submits and honors and serves his wife. And regardless of how they got into the marriage, whether it was from A to Z, it really doesn't help them to make this their last marriage and heal the family. Yes, God. We see the need desperately as we just look through the church and even through here in our country, the United States. The family's messed up. And may we as moms and dads, make the family whole again. Thank you for Charlie and for this church. Just your blessings and favor on them. And thank you for today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, before we slip out, let me just ask you today, and this is just... I know what it's like to be spiritually messed up, and I know what it's like to get fixed through the love of God. And I know what it's like to grow up in church and really not know Christ as your Savior. You just know Christ through the church. And it's just different when you believe in Jesus and you know Him. And I just don't want to presume as we wrap up that everybody here is at the same spiritual level and I don't want to blow off your spiritual journey because we're a few minutes past the time that we typically slip out because I don't know what you're going to face this week today I'm going to be doing a funeral at 3 o'clock here for uh, Tracy Bartu the Bartu family for her father and um, if you would have asked Tracy a week ago, is your dad going to be alive next Sunday? She should she would say, oh yeah, dad's going to be fine. Life has no guarantees. Zero. And I, I think where I'm at right here is this, that I'm believing that I'll be back here next Sunday and y'all will be here as well. But if by chance one of us steps into eternity, I'd sure like to know and I'd like you to know that you have the confidence that when you stand before God, He'll receive you. You're forgiven. You know, Jesus just is so, cl so clear. He just said, just believe on me. D just believe. Say, so how do I receive Jesus? Believe. Believe that He's God's Son, that He died for you. He rose from the dead. He gives victory over sin. Ask Him to be the Lord of your life. How many of you right here today just say, you know what, Charlie? I, I want to know that Christ has forgiven me of my sins and spiritually everything's all right between me and God. And I want to know that. I want to have Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. And I just want to have the confidence everything's all right between me and God. If that just describes you and you say, I don't have that confidence, I want that confidence. Uh, maybe you're confidently assured that you're not right with God 
and you want to get right with God whatever it is but you just just right now I mean I know we're all looking at but you say you know what I want that but you just put a hand up I just want to pray with you right where you're at not going to embarrass anybody thank you anybody else you can put your hand down anybody else thank you two three four anybody else I want to pray with you okay I want to ask everybody to stand we're going to pray this prayer together Craig and Gina thank you for coming it's been just a blessing. And I'm going to let you guys slip on out. And you know what? If you want to connect with Craig and Gina before they go, and they'll have those cards. And, and I encourage you to, to get that book when it comes out and get on their website and learn how to make uh, your blended situation better. The thing I love about the family of God is heaven is nothing but a blended family. And so you know what? It's all good. But we're going to pray right now. I'm going to ask everybody, let's just pray this together. Maybe you should have raised your hand, but you, you didn't. It's all right. Let's just pray together. And let's just know that we have the confidence that we have Christ as the center of our life. Pray this with me right now. Just say, dear Jesus, I thank you because you love me. And you came to the earth. You lived in a human world in order to give your life with full understanding for me and then you died for me but you didn't stay dead you decided to make a difference and so you resurrected from the dead and now you give life and so I'm asking you now forgive me of my sins come into my heart and bring the God life that you freely give. Establish it in my life. And with my mouth today, I confess that I am forgiven. And I confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord. And I am at peace with God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Father, I pray blessing over every person as they leave today. Thank you for the time we've had together. Now, Lord, as we go through the week, I pray blessing, protection, covering, safety, wisdom, understanding. God, just the ability to navigate through crisis and surprise. And, Father, I just ask that people walk in health and wholeness. They walk in prosperity and longevity. They walk in a wholeness of a relationship, living, giving, and receiving forgiveness and being established through Jesus Christ this week. So I just bless them real good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, have a